John Palmer joins me this week to discuss the state of the art in homebrewing. This is Beersmith Podcast number 300. This is Beersmith Podcast number 300, and it's early March 2024. My good friend John Palmer joins me this week to discuss the state of the art in homebrewing. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for homebrewers and beer lovers. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And also the Barrel Mill, creators of the Infusion Spiral used to add flavor and aroma to wine, spirits, and beer. Their unique spiral-cut design creates unrivaled surface area in a small package, allowing fast extraction of the toasted oak's aroma and flavor compounds. Looking for woods other than oak? Try their exotic woods, offering spirals made from amarana, American and French oak, aspen, Spanish cedar, cypress, and sugar maple. For more information, go to infusionspiral.com. Again, that's infusionspiral.com. And Beersmith Web, the online version of Beersmith Brewing Software. Beersmith for the Web lets you design great beer recipes from any browser, including your tablet or phone. Edit recipes on the go with access to the same full suite of recipe building tools as our desktop version. Try Beersmith Web by creating a free account at beersmithrecipes.com. And finally, a reminder to click that like and subscribe button on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, or whatever platform you're on. It's a great way to support the show. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome back John Palmer. John is the author of the top-selling homebrew book, How to Brew, as well as the definitive book on brewing water. Uh, Today, he joins us for our special episode number 300 to discuss the state of the art in homebrewing. John, it's uh, always great to have you on the show. How are you, my friend? I'm doing really well. It's good to be here. Yeah. It's uh, welcome to episode number 300. Hard to believe it's, uh, it's been that long. But, uh, yeah, that's quite the milestone. Yeah. You were, yeah, you were, you were actually, uh, you first appeared on episode number three. I looked it up uh, back in November of 2010. Uh, uh, wow, that's that's surprising. It's been that long, isn't it? Yeah, 2010. Yeah, yeah. and uh, this is actually your 19th time on the show, if you can believe that. Wow. Okay. <laughs> well, we got to do at least one more. <laughs> yeah. Round yeah. It up. Well, you're uh, you're also one of the most uh, downloaded guests. So uh, so great to have you, John. How are you? Um, I'm doing well. Thanks. So anyways, um, today you wanted to discuss some of the, uh, the state of the art in homebrewing and how homebrewing has uh, evolved a little bit over the years. Uh, last episode, I actually had on our friend, our good friend, John Blickman, yep. uh, discussing how equipment's kind of evolved over the last 30 years. Uh, uh yeah. but you've been, you've been in the business about that long as well. How, how has homebrewing changed from your perspective over the well, last it, period of time? That's, it's interesting that, you know, I, as you say, that you just talk equipment last time and uh, 300, you know, episode 300 versus three and so on. <laughs> yeah, it, it has evolved a lot over the last 15 years, um, last 20. Um, and and you, st- you, I believe, started homebrewing a year or two before I did back in the early 90s. Actually, I started in 87, if you can believe that. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I had my first homebrew in 87 or 85 or something like, but you know, as, as we say, um, yeah, it has, it has evolved a lot. Um, initially I think we as homebrewers were trying to copy, um, professional brewers, you know, methods and equipment because that was the only example we had. Now we had our good friend, Charlie Papazian, you know, saying, hey, it's not that difficult. You can do it with two buckets. Um, You can use malt extract and and brew with very simple equipment. And uh, I remember, oh gosh, you know, 20 years ago, having home brews where um, from, you know, they were just excellent uh, in terms of balance and lack of off flavors. I mean, they were just outstanding beers. brewed on very simple equipment um uh, and at at the time uh we were trying to go technical we were trying to uh build these uh three-tier systems gas-fired automatic 
burners and so on. And um, and and at the time, uh, we were brewing large batches. You know, um, ten gallon batches were not uncommon. Um, each of us had that one guy in our club that was brewing 20 gallon or 50 gallon batches, you know, <laughs> giant system. Um, and, uh, but the, I think part of the reason for that was because good craft beer, you know, in the, in the nineties was not really available. Um, you had your, your standard, uh, beers, Bud Miller and Coors. You had a few imports. Um, that you'd have to go to a special specialty bottle shop or something to find. Um, not like today where you walk into any grocery store, any gas station and get some Sierra Nevada, some stone, some, uh, tree house or, you know, whatever. I mean, you know, there's so much craft beer readily available today that I think that has been a big influence on the state of the art of home brewing. Um, so I guess, I guess I'm kind of wandering all over the topic, but, um, to sum it up, I think we're seeing, you know, recently a trend to generally to smaller batch sizes, um, smaller equipment, um, more compact equipment, um, and, uh, and simpler methods, I think overall as well. Um, I mean, with all the people you interview, are you seeing those same kind of trends yourself? Yeah. I mean, uh, especially when I talked to a lot of the equipment people, they said, you know, they're selling these uh, little tiny all grain, you know, brew in a bag style. I guess you call them all in one systems. Uh, yeah. And that seems to be the dominant form right now. The big, you know, 15 gallon giant yeah. <laughs> systems are not moving like they were, uh, you know, five, 10 years ago. Yeah. And hmm. I mean, I think part of it is, the fact that uh, I'm I'm getting older, I don't feel like you know hauling a 20 gallon pot off the top of the brew stand down to clean it and dump it. You know, um, it, it's it's uh, the smaller all in one. You know, for a five gallon batch size or even a two and a half gallon batch size is uh, much more convenient and and uh, practical for me these days. Well, I mean, what do you think is driving it? Is it is it like a, a byproduct of COVID? Is it is it the fact that you know people are gathering a little bit less? Is it is it just uh, the convenience of the smaller systems, or is the whole homebrewing industry aging? I don't know. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a combination of all those factors. But I think I think the biggest factor of all is the ready availability of good craft beer everywhere. Mm -hmm. So there isn't the drive to produce a lot of beer, you know, that you would drink throughout the month um, or when, and there isn't the drive to have, to brew a large batch size, to have all your buddies over for a weekend party, because you've got to supply the beer for everyone, the good beer for everyone. Um, these days, everybody can swing by the grocery store and grab a six pack of some really good craft beer of any style and and bring it and you know the, so that that you know the, we're we've talked with various friends like um as we age we're not drinking as much as we used to 20 years ago um but uh it, yeah it's it's that factor and the fact that um and i'm you know we're not brewing as much as we are uh, as we used to because for the same reason, it's so easy to go and buy beer um, or run over to a local brewery and bring home, you know, a couple six packs of their outstanding products. We don't have to brew it ourselves. Well, and I know I, I speak a lot of homebrew clubs. I know you talk to a lot of homebrew clubs as well. But, you know, during COVID, all that went online. And yep. um, and at least now when I go to go to speak at a lot of events, I, they, they seem to be smaller. I don't know if the I don't know exactly where the homebrew club uh, membership is, but they do seem to be, at least the in-person events seem to be smaller. Yeah, uh, you're right. The, the homebrew clubs have gotten smaller. Um, and I think uh, it's th for the same reasons, you know, we, we had, when we were young, we were joining homebrew clubs, uh, both to learn 
you know, the internet wasn't as big a factor. Um, you learned much better one on one with a you know brewer that had done it many times. Um, nowadays, internet provides all that information for you, uh, or you know, right there at your fingertips. And um, yeah, and and you used to we used to join homebrew clubs uh, to share good beer and uh, learn from each other. And and again, these the uh, internet has provided the information. The grocery stores have provided the the beer, so we don't have the same needs driving home brewing that we used to. Yeah, um, I think there'll always be home brewing for the same reason that you know you still get on YouTube and find you know fifty thousand videos for making your own bread at home. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's <laughs> and, and recipes and cooking and so on. I mean, yeah, there's always going to be home brewing but it is more of the occasional thing you know that you do once every couple months versus you know once a week i mean oh i i remember guys in my club brewing every weekend 10 gallons at a time uh because they were taking beer to parties and taking beer to events and that that uh need is just not there anymore yeah yeah well, let's get uh, let's get into the nuts and bolts of brewing a little bit. Um, one of the topics you wanted to talk about was use of adjuncts, uh, which does seem to be evolving uh, over time. Yeah uh, how how is that changing? Well, yeah, that's that's a fascinating topic. Um, the again with this ready availability of good craft beer, um, we're becoming much more familiar with diverse styles as you know as a general population the general public than we were 20 years ago um so a lot of those styles you make use of adjuncts and when you consider uh that the most popular beer style in the world american light lager is made with about 25 30 percent adjunct whether it's uh, flaked corn, corn syrup, rice syrup, or, or uh, flaked rice. I mean, you know, which, whichever form you want. Uh, the acceptance of adjuncts in brewing is is much more open now. <laughs> We're much more woke about that, if you will. Uh, whereas, you know, 15 years ago, uh, we were all, you know, pure malted barley only enthusiasts uh you know no adjuncts i you know that was that was the uh the call of that day was you know we we're we're brewing purists no adjuncts but um we learned that you know the judicious use of adjuncts and the and the the intelligent use of adjuncts in the in specific styles really make for great beer um and i think you can see this in the craft brewing market these days where you go to any you know good craft brewery and they've got their their double ipas and their hazy ipas and their you know imperial stouts and their barrel aged and their sour program but then you know you ask the brewmaster you know what's what's his current favorite the one he's really proud of and he'll haul out his municalis mm-hmm. or he'll haul out his american light lager um you know a delicate clean crisp beer um there really is you know a challenge uh, to brew uh in terms of you know getting the balance right getting the clean the uh cleanliness uh right you know no off flavors and so on uh really being able to dial in a fermentation to make that clean crisp beer is is uh, a real hallmark of your profession mm-hmm. um what are your thoughts on the overuse of caramel and crystal malts i know uh you know early on we were you know a lot of us were brewing with extract and got used to using a lot of caramel and crystal malt yeah um, oh i'm sorry. but now you're seeing you know much better alternatives for a lot of the styles today there's there's you know a lot of kiln malts that are just amazing yeah yeah um back in the day the first few editions of how to brew i mean uh every recipe i made had crystal malt in it um and uh gradually i uh was 
you know, learn to use uh, the kiln malts, the Munich, the Vienna, um, and uh, just, you know, judicious use of crystal malt these days. Um, I, I often think that, you know, in terms of you talk about the swing of a pendulum and public opinion and, you know, so 20, 30 years ago, crystal malt was all you had. And so we used a lot of it. Then more malts became available and we swing, we swung away from the use to crystal malt. And, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we talked about how the use of crystal 60 encouraged the, or cause could cause a beer to stale faster that, uh, that it didn't have as good a shelf life as a beer without crystal 60. Um, and so we've been kind of on that lean, I think, for a while now. We're trying to decrease the use of crystal malts. But I find as a beer judge that um, crystal, whether it's crystal 60 or 40 or 75 or 90, the judicious use of crystal malts has a real place in many, many beer styles. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I'm judging, uh, you know, whether it's Great American Beer Festival or World, World Beer Cup or one of the major competitions down in Mexico or South America, um, I'll often taste a beer and say, you know, there's some something missing. There's some roundness to the malt profile that could be better. Um, it's, you know, the beer is well fermented. It's nicely dry. But it's a bit thin on the on the mouthfeel or the finish. There needs to be some roundness to the malt, uh, and you know the use of some crystal malt can really provide that at around you know uh, anywhere from a two to five percent kind of addition. Uh, really does help round out the malt profile. Same with your kiln malts like Munich malt. A little bit of Munich malt can really go a long way to you know, giving some support and character to a malt profile, uh, the other than just base malt alone. Mm-hmm. Um, related to that, what do you think about the brew local trend? Uh, we're seeing it both at the homebrew level and the professional level. We're seeing craft malt houses pop up, uh, yeah. craft hops being grown or small, you know, small, small, uh, varieties of hops uh, popping up as well. Uh, even some smaller yeast houses have opened up. Um, what are yeah. your thoughts on that? Oh yeah. Um, there's the brew local, you know, drink local. Um, I think everyone should uh, try to support that as much as they can. I mean, it's it from both from an economic point of view and encouraging the craftsmen and and understanding, you know, the craft. Um, at the same time, um, you have to take those products with a grain of salt and. Uh, realize that there's going to be more variation in them, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, well, you can, you can spin it one way and say it's a feature, you know, that these are more unique malts, that you're, they're going to be unique hops, unique flavors that you won't get anywhere else. Or you can look at it the other way and say, well, you know, I'm not going to get the, necessarily get the kind of flavors I was looking for by using, you know, this farm's cascade hop or, you know, mosaic hop. Um, it doesn't have the same character as, you know, the Yakima Valley, uh, mosaic, for example. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's good. Um, but you have to understand the differences that it makes and what it's, what you're buying. Mm-hmm. With it. Uh, well, hazy IPAs seem to be the trendy beer of the moment, at least over the last few years. Um, oh, yeah. What tips do you have for making a good one? Um, I, I think, you know, for one, there's there's lots of videos uh, out there that give you probably better advice than me. But I think um, it is recipe proportions. You know, don't go overboard with the flaked oats and, and flaked wheat or wheat malt that you use um, to generate, you know, the haze. Um, and 
don't go overboard with your hop additions. Um, you know, there's, we, we always, as homebrewers, we always try to do more, you know, add an, that extra layer of, of, you know, whether it's bitterness or complexity or hop flavor, or juiciness or whatever, um, or the extra layer of haze in this case, um, you know, sometimes less is more and under, and as you brew, you're going to gain some perspective and experience on that better able, able, uh, better enable you to find that balance. Um, and, uh, I was, I was just, um, in the Boston area a couple of weeks ago for the new England district meeting and, uh, took that opportunity to drive over to Treehouse brewing mm-hmm. on their, their tasting room. I had never had, you know, their beers, um, or at least, you know, I probably had them in competition, but didn't know it at the time, of course. Um, but so I, I took the opportunity to go try uh, the orange, the Julius, and the Hazy, and a couple other beers that they had at their treehouse. And uh, my goodness, those are a step above some of the hazies that I've had here on the West Coast mm. um, in terms of you know depth of flavor, degree of haziness. I mean. They were literally as thick as you know orange juice, <laughs> and 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 people say that, but you know until I actually drank the beer for myself, you know in front of me, I didn't realize how true that was. Um, not exactly my cup of tea when I'm looking for a beer, but certainly uh, it was very interesting and helped me appreciate the style better. So. Um, yeah, you need you need um, you know 20, fifteen to twenty five percent of the of both oats uh, and wheat in in the in the grist uh, to help provide the basis for that haze. Um, you need to focus on whirlpool and dry hopping uh, with your hop additions um, and. Um, yeah, Treehouse does many videos that help explain their processes and and what they think their brewing tips are. But um, so I guess my best advice is to to go out and learn from the masters themselves. Uh, well, along with it, I've I've often complained on the show about the trend to IPA everything. Basically, take every yeah. beer and turn it into an IPA. But but most beer styles are not IPAs, and they really require a different approach, particularly for hopping. Yeah, and that and I think. That's another aspect of you know general public awareness of beer mm-hmm. styles, um, where we are swinging back and appreciating fine lager beers these days, which generally don't have a strong hop character. I mean, yeah, you can have a definite hop character in some pilsners uh, and some other you know German lagers, but so often it's the malt character of these beers that really is the primary uh focus or at least in better balance with a background hop character and so um one thing i push when i talk about recipe design and and uh talk about styles such as american light lager uh in my presentations is you know uh, back off on the finishing hop additions. Focus on the bittering hop addition. Get that nice and clean. Um, add a little bit of hops to finish. But you know, remember that you know, for many of the classic beer styles, basically everything outside of pale ale and IPA, uh, the malt should come first. And yeah. so you know, give it a chance, uh, especially as you're formulating that recipe and and conducting those hop additions in your process make sure that you're not uh clouding or muddying up that that malt character let that shine so john you also sent me a note about pseudo lagers uh what do you mean by a by a pseudo lager i wasn't really familiar with that term okay well um with the increased interest in lager beers um whether it's you know uh Bohemian Pilsner, German Pilsner, Italian Pilsner, or um, 
American uh, light lager. Uh, there's, you know, to get a good lager, it has to have a good fermentation. Mm -hmm. um, you have to have sufficient yeast pitching um, and, you know, uh, the lagering cycle itself is a bit of an art. A um, couple different ways to do that. You can do it short and warm or you can do it long and cold. Both will work. But it is a realm where attention to detail is critical. Now, uh, of course, many people want to brew uh, these lager styles. And so uh, if they don't have the kind of temperature control, you know, with a, with a controller on a refrigerator or the right climate, um, you can brew pseudo lagers with uh, different yeasts. Um, the, uh, the 3470 yeast strain that we all often use can produce a very good lager up to 60 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh -huh. um, I've done it. You've done it. Um, it can make a very passable lager with only, you know, a small increase in the esters, even up to those warm temperatures. Um, the Kvike strains uh, are exemplary in that fashion where you can brew those at, you know, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which represents kind of a cold fermentation for Kvike. Uh, and they can produce a very clean tasting beer with, you know, a little bit of Kvike character, mm -hmm. um, which is not exactly, you know, it is not, you know, uh, technically a lager. Um, it is a different, you know, it is a light grist bill with a, with brewed with an entirely different yeast strain. So it is not a lager, but it is lager like in its, you know, in its flavor. And so that's what I mean when with, from these pseudo lagers where you're trying to imitate uh, and match the characteristic of a classic lager style but using ingredients and methods that uh, lend themselves to your situation. Yeah, we were in Cologne last year, and of course, uh, they have the Kolsch, uh, yeah. which is another great uh, yeast to use if you want something you know, that's very, very close to a lager. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, finally, you, wanted to, you mentioned wanting to present your five brewing priorities, so I was hoping you could uh, maybe quickly summarize them, and then uh, we can spend a little bit of time diving into each one, if you will. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, you know, going back to this, you know, whole state of the art, um, even though, you know, our, our equipment has evolved over the last 30 years and our techniques have evolved a bit. Um, and certainly, you know, as we've just discussed with ingredients and yeast availability and so on, uh, much more options available to us. These five, uh, priorities still, you know, hang true. Um, number one, good sanitation. You know, you still have to have good sanitation if you want your beer to turn out right, because we want the yeast to ferment the beer, not some, you know, uh, wild yeast or bacteria. Um, number two is all about your yeast management, you know, proper pitching rate. Uh, number three is your in fermentation conditions, you know, temperature and also as well as aeration and so on. Uh, you, that's, as I often say, the uh, good fermentation of a bad recipe will make a better beer than the bad fermentation of a good recipe. Mm. Uh, fermentation is key. And so understanding that it is your yeast management and your fermentation conditions that are very important. I mean, they're second only to, you know, proper sanitation. Um, those are the second and third priorities. From there, uh, number four could be um, the boil, I think. The, and sh you know, during the boil, we are generating a lot of the flavors from the malt. Um, we're, you know, a lot of uh, reactions are occurring during the boil, both hop isomerization, uh, concentration of the wort. Uh, melanoidin reactions. There's a lot of chemistry occurring during the boil. So uh, understanding that we're 
depending on the boil to generate a lot of the flavors in our beer um, is is a priority. And then finally, recipe proportions. Um, as I said, you know, good recipe, bad recipe, understanding the proportions of ingredients, um, trying to make, you know, it's kind of like trying to make a sandwich. You know, you don't want to, you know, have uh, very thin bread and, and a whole jar of mustard with uh, just one pickle. I mean, you know, that's not a, that's not a very good sandwich. Uh, you get the, you want to get the proportions of the ingredients right. And so um, it's, you know, number five, it's, you can, you can brew a good beer uh, with almost any recipe, but understanding the proportions will make it better. Great. Uh, well, we got a few minutes, so let's go through each one uh, in a little more detail, starting perhaps with sanitation. Uh, one of the things I always like to talk about, for example, is that there's a difference between cleaning and sanitation, right? Yeah, that's very true. Um, you can't really sanitize something that's not clean. And very often uh, on the hot side, that is everything that occurs prior to the boil, um, you can be satisfied with simply being clean that is the surface of your you know vessel and so on and your equipment being clean of debris and uh, foreign contaminants um sure. like you know bug guts or something dirt. yeah dirt that's cleaner um and then in the cold side once you've passed the boil uh now you have to be more concerned about uh cleanliness and sanitation and it is important to sanitize your surfaces that come in contact with the wort. The wort of course is a very nutritious growth medium for the yeast and we want to keep that wort for the yeast. We don't want any wild yeast from the air or you know from a surface such as a spoon that's been sitting out or a fermenter that wasn't properly cleaned um, and sanitized. We don't want any other microorganisms to be present on those surfaces. And so when you sanitize something, use either uh, heat or chemical methods to, to, to do a uh, what we call a five log or a six log reduction in the uh, number of micro, microorganisms that exist on those surfaces. And so when something's sanitized, it means that those those organisms are no longer present in any number, you know, in a sufficient number to be able to reproduce enough to contaminate our wort or our beer. Mm -hmm. um, let's go on to, to sufficient yeast pitching. Uh, I know we've, we've, we did an episode on this, I think, some time ago, but uh, yeah. can you talk a little bit about why having, particularly under pitching, I guess, is, is, is a problem for many home brewers? Yeah. Um, yeast pitching rates uh, we are very important because essentially what we're doing is we're setting up the conditions where the yeast will ferment the sugars uh, and produce our beer and then uh, hang around, still be active, and clean up the byproducts they create during the early stages of fermentation. and. Um, I guess you know if you're new to brewing, this may seem uh, kind of kind of far out, but um, when yeast ferment, they take in a lot of nutrients from the wort, amino acids, um, sugars, uh, lipids. Lipids are like fatty acids and so on. Um, just like you know, when we eat, we try to eat a balanced meal. The yeast try to eat a balanced meal as well, and the wort provides that. If you give the yeast conditions uh, where it's warm, they're, they're ready to go, um, they will eat those sugars quickly. And it's like when you sit down to a buffet, you know, you're just shoveling food in, you're making sure you get your money's worth, um, you're not taking your time. And, uh, you know, if you're eating like, for example, chicken wings, you know, you don't clean the the wings to the bone uh where you know you're just you'll eat half of it and set it aside that same kind of you know uh mentality kind of exists with the yeast uh when you first pitch the yeast to the wort if it's nice and warm and they're 
act, highly active, they're going to start processing sugars and throwing off lots of waste products as they ferment. Those waste products um, can be acetaldehyde, can be acetohydroxy acids that make diacetyl, uh, a number of short chain fatty acids, aldehydes. Um, fusel, all, I think. Fusel alcohol. Yeah, fusel alcohols. Uh, there's there's a whole host of these fermentation byproducts that can be expressed into the beer that don't make for a good beer. Um, if you don't pitch enough yeast, the yeast will generate those byproducts, uh, and but you know they have kind of a finite life. They can only reproduce so many times, and then they fall dormant. And uh, you can, if you underpitch the batch, don't pitch enough yeast. The the yeast may not get through all of the sugars by the time they. Uh, reach the end of their life cycle and go dormant. And so you can end up with an under attenuated beer and or a beer that just has lots of these byproducts left behind, the diacetyl, the fusel alcohols, the uh, acetaldehyde, uh, all these different things. If you pitch a sufficient amount of yeast, the yeast will ferment the sugars and they will still be hungry at the end of the fermentation, they'll be still be hungry when they finish those sugars. And now they're looking around saying, what else can we eat? Ah, we have these byproducts. I can still process those. Um, and they'll clean up the diacetyl. They'll clean up the acetaldehyde. And this is what we call the maturation phase of fermentation. Um, so, you know, part of being a good brewer and a good cellarman is understanding um, this the yeast pitching rates and the fermentation conditions in order to promote good maturation and clean up of the beer. Mm -hmm. um, you discussed uh, fermentation temperature, of course, just a minute ago when you were discussing yeast and why it's important yeah. to keep it at the right temperature. Uh, can you talk about the boil, perhaps? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, well, as we were saying, you know, the boil is where a lot of the chemistry happens. Um, I mean, a lot of chemistry happens in the mash. We're setting up the conditions and the wort that will come into play during the boil. Um, and among those is the pH of the wort. Um, so when we go to the boil, uh, when we add our hops, the hops will, is will isomerize, the alpha acids will isomerize to create the bitterness that we want in the beer to balance the sweetness of the malt. And um, isomerization has basically two factors. It's a chemical reaction. So one factor is temperature. The higher the temperature, the, the more the alpha acids will isomerize, that is change their molecular geometry to make them more soluble and and more accessible to our taste buds. And then the other one is pH. And the pH is uh, essentially how far uh, the percentage of, of, of alpha acids that will isomerize. Um, and pH is not a measure of that. pH is a measure of chemical equilibrium. And uh, in, in and that represents the equilibrium of our isomerization. So oh. I get I'm not explaining that very well, but uh, you know, the higher the pH, the more isomerization will occur during the boil. But it will be a different flavor depending um, from the hops. It can higher pH tends to make the bitterness uh, a little harsher, a little bit coarser than a lower pH. Lower pH less isomerization um but uh the this the character of the bitterness seems to be not nicer mm -hmm. and then finally uh good recipe proportions and we did talk a little bit about this we were talking about specialty malts but you know really you know you really most of your beer should be base malt right yeah you know 80 80 90 percent of your any recipe, any beer recipe is base malt. So getting a good quality base malt that, you know, when you chew the kernels has a good flavor, a good bready, malty flavor, uh, that's key because that is the flavors you're going to taste in your beer. Um, 
when you go to add, you know, uh, specialty malts to that, uh, the specialty malts that may be characteristic of a specific style, for example, Irish stout, you know, you add roasted barley or black malt, um, you know, you want to add enough to contribute that signature flavor, but you don't want to make a, a stout that is 50% black malt because that will, that will overwhelm the balance of the beer and uh, you'll lose the, the breadiness and the maltiness of the base malt and only be left with a, uh, a black malt flavor or a coffee-like flavor. So, uh, yeah, most, most beer styles, you want to include a signature specialty malt, whether it's Munich malt um, for a dark lager or a black malt or for a porter or stout, crystal malt for a amber ale. Uh, you want to use an appropriate proportion, and that typically is somewhere between 5 and 15%. Um, 15 for a very, you know, strong character. Well, John, uh, we are running a little bit low on time, but I wanted to, uh, before I go, I wanted to mention that you actually have a new book coming out, uh, but this one's yeah. actually going to be in Spanish, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, over the last few years, I've been working on a book I call how to brew in your kitchen. And, uh, as you know, as I've seen the evolution, um, of, the hobby in terms of equipment and technique over the last, you know, 10 years, um, we're moving towards simpler uh, processes. Um, I think brew in a bag is a very easy way to boil, uh, to, to brew a beer. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, we've seen the transition to all-in-one type systems, um, a lot less cleanup. You know, when I think back to the couple hours I used to have to spend at the end of a brew day, you know, washing out large uh, kettles and so on, um, cleaning out my pumps and this and that, you know. Um, it's an all-day affair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where now I'm brewing on a, on a smaller all-in-one. It's much easier to clean up. It takes me half an hour tops to get that, you know, cleaned up at the end of the day. Uh, it's really nice. Um so this book, How to Brew in Your Kitchen, focuses on uh, a simple brewing method. You know, brew in a bag, no sparge. Um, I start out with a two and a half gallon or 10 liter batch size because that's about as much wort as you can easily boil on a kitchen stove or hot plate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, you've, as my own children, you know, uh, moved out of the house and moved into apartments, and I would go visit. It's like, wow, you don't have much space in here, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I realized, you know, it's like, yeah, today's new brewer. I mean, they don't have, you know, the garage or the shed out back to do their brewing in like we did uh, at a different point in our lives. Um, they're in an apartment. They've only got a limited amount of space. They've got a standard kitchen stove that really can't put out a lot of heat. And so that 10 liter, two and a half gallon maybe three gallon batch size is about all you can really boil conveniently. And two and a half gallons is a good batch size for getting, you know, about one case worth of beer to enjoy afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people may start with like a one gallon batch size, but you only get, you know, maybe three, four cans out of, of beer out of that <laughs> three or four bottles. Um, kind of, you know, it's a lot of work for just three or four bottles. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think I think you know two and a half is a good is a good happy medium there. We're coming coming anyway. full circle to, to to brewing on the stovetop again. Where can people find the book, John? Well, it is currently in production. Um, they hope to have it released uh, towards the end of 2024. It is going to be in Spanish and published in Mexico and South America. Um, Brewers Publications. I offered it to them, but they felt that it would cut into sales of how to brew. Okay. Um, fair, but I think it would serve as a good introductory book for new brewers that are interested in learning about brewing. Yeah. I mean, this I, one's not as in depth. I think, I think your current, you know, how to brew is what, four or 500 pages or something, right? Exactly. And this is going to be about 150 pages, <laughs> right. very, you know, streamlined process, uh, you know, to allow you to pick up a book, 
um, and brew good beer easily at home. That's that's the whole goal of it. Well, John, uh, good luck with your new book, and I, I, a pleasure you. having you on for for episode number three hundred. I want to just really quick your closing thoughts on uh, on the state of the art in home brewing. Yeah, it's going back to simpler is better. Uh, going back to you know easy brewing techniques, no sparge, um, but still focused on brewing superior beer. Awesome. Well, John, uh, thank you again for coming on the show. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you very much, Brad. Pleasure. Today, my special guest for episode number 300 was Mr. John Palmer, uh, my good friend as well, author of How to Brew, uh, uh, which is, of course, the definitive book on uh, brewing, as well as the definitive book on brewing water. Uh, thank, thank you again, John. My pleasure. A big thank you to John Palmer for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for homebrewers and beer lovers. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com. And also the Barrel Mill, creators of the Infusion Spiral, used to add flavor and aroma to wine, spirits, and beer. Their unique spiral cut design creates unrivaled surface area in a small package, allowing fast extraction of the toasted oak's aroma and flavor compounds. Looking for woods other than oak? Try their exotic woods, offering spirals made from Amburana, American and French oak, aspen, Spanish cedar, cypress, and sugar maple. For more information, go to infusionspiral.com. Again, that's infusionspiral.com. And Beersmith Web, the online version of Beersmith Brewing Software. Beersmith for the Web lets you design great beer recipes from any browser, including your tablet or phone. Edit recipes on the go with access to the same full suite of recipe building tools as our desktop version. Try Beersmith Web today by creating a free account at beersmithrecipes.com. I'd like to thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great brewing week. (music) 